July 17th is about 5.45 p.m. My name is Steve Brown. I'm with the Cantini First Division Oral History Project at Ball State University. And I'm speaking today, we're in Hudson, Ohio. I'm speaking today with Mr. Dave Peters. Is that correct? Mr. Yes, it Peters. is. Can you spell your last name for us, please? P-E-T-E-R-S. And Mr. Peters, why don't you tell us about uh, where you were born, your family, where you grew up? That sort of thing, please. Uh, I was born in Alliance, Ohio, small town east of Canton, Ohio. Uh, I have three brothers and three sisters. Uh, my father was a welder at, uh, at first at Babcock and Wilcock, and when they closed down, he had other jobs, and then he went on to work for Ford Motor Company when she retired. Uh, we were real close-knit family. We basically did everything together. We didn't have any money to do anything, so we all went together did things that were free around the city. And One of the things I remember most vividly with my dad is coming home from church like on a Sunday and sitting down in front of the TV while he watched his uh, military documentaries. There was a one show on called uh, Navy Log because he was in the Navy, and he would sit down, you know, with me and my brother, and he would explain everything on the uh, the ships and things like that. And Did he serve in World War Two? He or? served in World War Two on a destroyer. Okay, and you were born in '45. I was born in '45. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, when did you graduate from high school? I graduated high school in 63 and uh, we're in town at uh, the local gas station and everything and my brother wrote me who was in the service at the time. He was at the Presidio San Francisco and he wrote me and says, hey Dave, uh, can you bring out my car to me? I, I'm allowed to have a vehicle on base, so you want to bring it in out. So no hesitation whatsoever. I took the money out of the bank and off I went to California. I dropped off his car to him, and we had friends living out there, and I stayed with them and went to work again for the local Chevron dealer out there until I got drafted in 1965. What, did you come home before you went off to report? or before Yeah, you I, uh, I left Oakland, California and drove home and I think got home about a month before I was actually inducted. What, what response did your parents have? Well, my brother was already in, so the initial shock of having, you know, one son in was more or less over, but they were still, you know, concerned anytime, you know, one of your boys goes into the service. And at, time, at the time, Vietnam wasn't as publicized as it was later on. So I really didn't hear anything about Vietnam until it was in advanced training. Okay. Where did you go for your... Uh, basic. I went to Fort Benning, Georgia for basic. What was and, the, I'm sorry, go I'm sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Well, my question is, what was the transition from civilian to soldier like for you? Uh, it was pretty rigorous. Um, the getting up in the morning, the you know, they tell you when to eat, they tell you when to sleep, they tell you when to do everything. And, you know, first starting out, it was, you know, it was overpowering. But then, just like everybody else, after a while you fell into it. You made your friends, you, you know, the Army was just, you know, another day in the life. It was just like a job after that. Anything in particular that you remember about any vivid memories from basic? Oh yeah, there's a lot of them. I mean, we had, I remember they told us anytime you leave the company steps, you double time. 
and you know, whether it was to child, uh, formation, whatever, you had to double time. And I remember that doing that for you know 16 weeks. You never walked anywhere. You always double time. And going to the classes that they had that were real boring, and you're always sleeping, always sleeping. Somebody is always sleeping. And the drill sergeants always try and put one over on you by saying, OK, I want everybody to sit still. And when I say attention, everybody sit still. It's just seeing who will jump up. Uh, one time he did that, and he yelled, attention. And one guy jumped up. And he says, oh, Sergeant Smith, where do you buy your pink underwear from? So, and uh, Private Smith says, I don't know, Sarge, but you and I must be the only one and get them because we're the only ones standing. Um, <laughs> there's little things like that. How did that. the sergeant <laughs> respond to that? And he just laughed. You know. But there were some. There were, there were a lot of good times. A lot of good times there. Uh, I'm and on the hand grenade range. Just another thing is mispronunciation of names. He was given the talk on hand grenades. He being the sergeant. He being the, the tech sergeant was given the you know demonstration and the, everything on the hand grenades and he says and once you pull this pin and you throw this hand grenade and you see somebody that falls it's not necessarily the shock that kills them it would be the flying dervis, meaning debris. He got the letters. <laughs> and I just said, like, and then, you know, from the rest of the time, anytime we heard or used the word debris, it was dervis. Dervis. But it, all in all, basic, once you got past the initial shock, the rhetoric, the, the PT every morning, the, you know, whatever, you got comfortable in your surroundings. Basic training really wasn't bad at all. Um, where'd you go for AIT? I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. The whole of the United States. It, uh, it really was a whole. I have nothing good to say about Fort Polk. Um, and they had... Uh, I mean, it was, you would think that Louisiana would be warm, but there were some nights it was cold. I mean, they had to fire up the furnaces and that. And they had one town close by. It was Leesville. And every once in a while, guys would sneak out and go to Leesville. And I can remember on the radio, listening, from the, listening to the local radio station, they said, uh, there was a furniture store having a sale, and they says, oh, and come to so-and-so uh, furniture store this weekend for a fabulous sale. Uh, furniture, the furniture store is located right across the street from the traffic light. So I just told you how big that city was at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But that, again, it was advanced training, and that's when I first heard about Vietnam and had an idea of where I was going and where all the training was leading to, the night ambushes, the uh, when we were out on maneuvers, we had to wear our field jackets with the liners in them, our pots on all the time, just to get used to the heat. Um, all the training, like I said, went around what the conditions may or not be in Vietnam. Uh, First Division, I believe, went over there by boat in 64 or 65. I was their replacements going in in 66. So the ones that were already over there, I was going over as a replacement for them. So I don't think that when I went in, they really knew that much about Vietnam, except from what they heard from the advisors and that. 
but they, you know, I mean, they were deaf on you for you know doing certain things. When you walk, you just couldn't walk. You had to eyeball everything for booby traps, for fungi stakes, or you know whatever. That that's basically when the reality of war came to me. Mm -hmm. At AIT, did you receive any specialized training? Oh yeah. What? Yeah, what that, I mean, basically all the training was. My specialized training was. Uh, Infantrymen. I was small arms. arms, small arms infantry. So you learned to use what? I learned to use a, a 45 M16, a M79 grenade launcher, M60 machine gun. That was about it. Okay. Did you get leave before you went over? Yeah, to we got two weeks leave from Fort Polk before we had to be in uh, Oakland, California. What'd you do during that leave? Just hung out, visited with my friends, my you know my family, and you went back to the Alliance. Yeah, I went back to the Alliance. Didn't make a big thing about going to Vietnam. I had every indication that you know I was coming back. So, I mean, I went into the whole thing with a uh, positive attitude. You know, I'm coming back. So, we really didn't make a big thing of it. Where was your brother at the time you went to Vietnam? My brother was in Vietnam. How'd that happen? Uh, never did find out. Who was I had he a with? brother and an uncle there. My brother was with uh, Mac V uh, down around China Beach, and my uncle was in the Air Force at uh, Tonsonut. Okay. Um, but uh, my brother and I were. There about the same time, our tours about four months intersected, and my uncle about three months out of that. Did uh, that give you pause? Did it make you stop and think about no, anything? No, my brother, I mean, other than being in an area where, you know, a mortar could get anybody. My brother was a clerk typist, so he wasn't out in the field or anything. Wasn't it Army uh, policy then that two brothers couldn't be in a war zone together? Well, that, I questioned that. I said to my CO one time, I says, I have a brother down around Camron. Uh, I didn't think two brothers could be in the same theater together. And they told me, well, we can do one of two things, or one of three things. We can send you back home and give you some job from the States for a while, and then bring you back when your brother's back in the States. We can send your brother back home early, which they would just send him to some base for X amount of time. Or we can forget the whole thing. So I tried to get in touch with my brother to find out what he wanted to do, but by the time I finally got in touch with him, with mail and that, he was just about on his way home, so. How long had you been uh, in Vietnam before you put two and two together on that? Before you made that request or started Oh, checking? two weeks. Okay. What was your first impression of Vietnam? It was a blast furnace. We opened up the door of that jet to walk out, and that blast of hot tropical air hit me. And I said, man, it was just, I mean, just, well, coming out of an air conditioned plane, too, but walking out onto that tarmac, it was like a blast furnace. And there was a smell that you smelt your whole tour. Vietnam has it, had its own distinct smell, and there's sometimes I can still smell it. Can you describe that smell? No. It's uh, uh, the best I could think of is some musky odor, but. It was just one big, distinct smell. Never forget it. 
Did you arrive in the dry season or the wet season? Or the dry season. season. Okay. And I, we, I was from March to March, March okay. 66 to March 67. 11 months, 27 days. Okay. Um, uh, where did you go after you got off the plane? Went into uh, 90th replacement where they do all the processing. Uh, they give you your orders, where you're going to go. Uh, Did you know you were going to 1st Division before you got no. there? Mm -mm. Had no idea where I was going. Did you know anything about the 1st Division? No, I had no idea whatsoever. Okay. I uh, got off the plane and just followed everybody else through processing, and I was in processing, uh, I guess it was two days. And when they were processing... When you were done with your processing for that day, you did guard duty and you no know, work around the base. And then they put you on a truck, and I think I went to a small camp in the rear someplace. I believe it was Camp Roberts or something like that, where uh, they got all the guys together that were going to go to the 1st Division together, and then they took one truck there and got there and I was there for about another five days before they actually choppered us out and took us out in the field. And What were you doing during those five days? Duty, just dishes and cooking and KP and putting up tents, putting up uh, buildings, just, you know, work around the base. And they got us all up one morning and said, okay, we're all going out to the field. So, you know, gather up all your stuff. You know. Went over to the uh, airfield and I'm we're all sitting down. I'm sitting on my helmet, and there's a sergeant standing right beside me. And he says, Does anybody know how to use a radio? And I'm, do, 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 do. It's the old, you never volunteer for anything. And he said a little bit louder, Does anybody here know how to run a radio? <laughs> he looked straight down at me and says, didn't they teach you how to run radio at basic? I said, yes, Sergeant. He said, okay, you're the new radio man. <laughs> so when I finally got out to the field, they handed me a radio, and I was a radio man. So, where, did, where did you go in the field, first stop? First place I went to was an area called Cam Mai. Okay. Uh, now, I was in Vietnam for less than two weeks. I was out in the field for less than four days, and my company got almost wiped out. We got in a firefight, walked into an ambush on April the 11th, 1966, and we sustained 80% casualties in one day. That was my welcome to Vietnam. Did you ever see worse combat no. than that? No, never. What's your recollection of that battle? That battle, the it seemed that the firefight was so thick, you could s almost see the bullets. I mean, that's all you heard. It's in continuous gunfire, mortars, in a, the the guys screaming, calling for their mom, for the medic. It was just horrendous. Uh, and then there was a law, there was a stop. Both sides, for some reason, stopped shooting. Uh, they started to cut an LZ in the jungle. It was triple canopy, which means that there was three layers of foliage. 
can you describe those three layers of foliage? You had your small trees and bushes and that that would grow up, and then your bigger trees would grow up over them, and then again your bigger trees would grow up over those. So and if you look down, that's all you're seeing was you know, green, but there's actually you know, three levels. They called it a triple canopy. And we tried to uh, cut down some of the trees, and then firefight started again. How were you cutting down the trees? Machetes. The appointment carried machetes. Okay. So they, uh, we got in a firefight again. Why were you cutting a landing zone? To get the wounded out. Okay. I figured if we got in some choppers, we could get some of the wounded out. Because we didn't know how big a force we'd ran into. You'd run into the D-800, correct? D-800. And that was a North Vietnamese? Regular Army. Now, this was your first engagement. What were you, to, over the course of the next year, what did you discover were the differences between North Vietnamese Regular Army and the Viet Cong? Well, it seemed like the Viet Cong were more or less hit and run. You know, they would hit and fire on you and try and do as much damage as they could in a small amount of time and then take off. Whereas the D-800 just dug in and kept on pounding us and pounding us and pounding us, you know, for hours. What kind of weapons? Oh, all kinds of automatic weapons. Uh, they had some mortars. Supposedly, from what I heard, they had 50 calibers in the trees. I don't know whether that was, whether it was just a machine gun or 50 calibers. And the machine gunners in the trees, of course, had their, their ammo on them. And there was more than one shootist up there. And if he got hit, another one would come down and splice it on the belt and keep right on shooting. And uh, it went on all night long. Was and there artillery coming in on you? Yeah, we had artillery coming in as close as we could get. How about on you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They had, that, like I said, they had some mortars trained in on our position. Do you remember about what time of day the engagement started? Mm, I'm going to say, like, I believe, I believe... It was like nine in the morning. What were you I doing? I think I'm not. What were you doing at that time? We had just cut. You personally, Dave. Peter. Was I personally doing? Was setting up a setting up a perimeter. I was the radio man uh, for the XO and for the uh, command. So I was just mo sitting monitoring the radios. Who was the XO? And my XO was uh, Lieutenant Alderson. Was he the XO in, when you went into battle? Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your memory of Lieutenant Alderson? Oh, I know. I remember that uh, he seemed calm to me. He seemed calm all the time. I mean, directing fire and whatever. He, I mean, he just seemed calm, like this was uh, another day and another job day at work, and that is my most vivid recollection. How he felt inside, I don't know, but to me, he just said, you know, he seemed calm. And you were right next to him the whole time. No, I was uh, with my company commander for part of the time until he got shot. And then, you know, I was with uh, Lieutenant Alderson for some time. Who was your company commander mm. at the time? Just forgot. <laughs> so he was shot and then Lieutenant Alderson right. mm -hmm. took charge. Right. He was shot and killed? The company commander, no, shot and wounded. Just wounded? Yeah. So this all 
starts at nine o'clock or so oh, in the morning. You're right. That's your recollection. Do you remember how it started? What's the first thing you heard? Uh, we had gotten some, if I remember it, we had gotten some gunfire, some incoming, and they sent a squad out to go after them. And there was more gunfire, and one of the guys in the squad was killed, and they told him to come back. And they brought everybody back, and then we received more gunfire, and then it just escalated into that. And then it was just constant gunfire from all around. Aside from trying to clear out that landing zone, what did you guys do? Uh, tried to bring in all the wounded into the center of the perimeter so the medics could take care of it. Uh, tried to set up fields of fire, you know, find out where the, the worst gunfire was coming from. Uh, just try to defend ourselves. What were you doing? I was on the radio. Okay. And what are you doing on the radio? Uh, when somebody would call for the CEO or the XO, I would get them and give them the radio. How did you, what emotions were going through you? Oh, first one was fear. Your number one emotion is fear. I don't care what anybody says, it has to be fear. Uh, fear of being shot, fear of being shot and killed, fear of being shot and, you know, left a paraplegic, you know, disfigured. But fear is your number one. I mean, the adrenaline is just pumping. And after that, it's self-preservation. You get a weapon and you find the biggest tree and you get down and you fire from it. Uh, of course, everybody's screaming. They're, you know, telling you where the gunfire's coming from. You know, they're telling you, you know, they're in the trees. They're over on the left. They're on the right. They're, you know, whatever. So you aim your fire from that. After that, another radio man took over, so I went and uh, picked up a rifle and started firing. Why would another radio man take over for you? Well, some of the, uh, you had all kinds, you had like four radios there, and you just had one, one can monitor like two radios. And these guys had been there a lot longer than I had. And they knew who they were looking for and they knew who they wanted. And so more experienced radio men came over. Okay. And I went, grabbed a rifle. And did what? Started firing, started at, shooting. At what? The trees, because you could, a lot of times you would look out in the trees and you would see the leaves rustling. Or you could almost, from where the rounds were hitting the ground, you could tell that they were up high. So you aimed in the direction where you thought the fire was. It's hard to see, but you just, that's what you shot at. You couldn't shoot directly ahead of you because you had your troops out there. We were in the center of a circle. And if you shot straight ahead, you were at risk of shooting your own troops. So. Basically, shot from you know, shot at the trees and stuff like that. Did you ever hit anyone? I'd never seen one if I did. Okay, would that be true of your entire tour in Vietnam? No, no, you never saw. No, that's not true. I had seen one man that I shot. What was that like? Sickening, it made me sick. When was that? About two months down the road, we got into another firefight and. Uh guy was crossing a path, and I seen him, and I shot him. And I didn't go back to check, but I know I hit him. Okay. But it just, it just, it, to know that you took a life at that time made you sick, but it was the old adage, you know, kill or be killed. Uh, it didn't give me a good feeling. Okay. You ever think about that? 
Pardon? Have you ever thought about that since? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to have nightmares. When I got back, I had nightmares for years. Okay. Uh, people that I stayed with, roommates, whatever, said that, you know, I'd wake up screaming, I'd wake up yelling. A lot of times I know I'd wake up, I'd be in a cold sweat. Uh, I can remember times dreaming about Vietnam and firefights and being back there. I mean, just like it was yesterday. Used to have them all the time when I got out. How long did that go on? About 10 years. Every once in a while I'll have, not so much now, but every once in a while I'll have flashbacks of them. Have any problems with loud noises? Yeah. When I got back, I did. I hear a loud noise, and I'd hit the dirt. And, uh, it's crazy at Fourth of July for about the first five years. I couldn't enjoy fireworks or whatever. I would just sit in my house and, you know, live through it, any type of fireworks. Backfires from cars would send me down to the pavement. You know. Let's go back to Cam I. You're there and you are shooting up, you're mm -hmm. shooting down. What happens? Did they get the landing zone cleared ever? Yeah, they, uh, the gunfire stopped. We had, if I remember right, it was three separate engagements and every time the perimeter got smaller. Uh, the second time we called for um, more ammo and stuff. They also called for chainsaws and we finally got the landing zone cleared. Uh, the Air Force came in and started pulling up the guys that were wounded on what they called a, one of their stretchers, a Stokes litter. And we, of course the guys on the ground didn't know anything about it. So one of their airmen came down, a guy by the name of Pitzenbarger. He came down and helped us load up the guys that were wounded. And then the helicopter would take off and another one would come in. How do you remember the name Pitzenbarger? Pitzenbarger in December of 2000 was awarded the Medal of Honor. The Air Force had gotten in touch with the people from Charlie Company that they could find. Uh, they had heard about Pitzenbarger and at one time in 66, I think he was put in for the Medal of Honor, but it never came about, so they wanted to redo it. And he, uh, Congress finally awarded him the medal. It was given to his father at Wright Pat Air Force Base. And it was given to him by the Secretary of the Air Force. So Pitsenbarger didn't make it home? No. What do you remember about his actions? I remember that he came down on that stretcher and my CO told me to go over there and give him a hand. We went over there and helped him, helped him load him up. We got eight of them out. And I remember he, when I first went over there, it, I couldn't tell where he came from because his uniform was different than mine and, you know, everything. I, finally I realized it was Air Force because I seen the name on it. And, you know, we just helped load him, and he was, when he wasn't helped loading him, he was administering first aid to the real wounded and that. We got out our last one that we could, and as it was, the chopper was going up, it started receiving fire. And one round hit the chopper, and it looked like, the chopper was going to go into the trees and come down, but he finally got it up. And I remember Pitts and Barker going, you know, and saying to me or whatever, because he wasn't wired for sound, 
He says, oh, I'll probably get the next one that goes out. So the chopper took off and the gunfire started up again. And he just, from what I heard from the other GIs on the ground, again, he was with the first aid. He was out getting rifles and ammunition and that for guys that uh, were running out of ammo. Uh, he was up and one of the sergeants was hit pretty bad and Bill went and got drug bodies over to the sergeant and put bodies on top of him because the the Viet Cong were coming in and shooting survivors and taking guns and money and you know so he put bodies on top you of You saw them doing this? No, this is what Sergeant Navarro told me. So, but all th supposedly all during the night this is what he was doing and sometime during the night he was shot. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh it was. After, so, you know, this is still in daylight that you were helping Pittsburgh mm -hmm. evacuate the wounded. Mm -hmm. What happened next? Well, the gunfire kept up until it was dark. In the dark, we got back all the bodies that we could back inside the perimeter. And then it was just everybody stay awake because the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong out out in the jungle were, you know, just saying things like, you know, give up and uh, we're going to come in full force, we're going to wipe everybody out. Uh, they're just harassment all night long. And then... Somebody speaking English? No, they were speaking in Vietnamese, but we have interpreters who were relaying what they were saying. So everybody was just on guard because we were expecting the final assault. And it never came. At that point, it, you had you incurred your eighty percent casualties. At that point, uh, yeah, just about. There was one point in time. I don't know whether it was during the lull or what, but I was standing up and I was walking away from something, and all of a sudden I felt this calm. I felt this calm. And, you know, it just, like a light coming down on me. It says, you know, I know I'm going to die, but it's okay. And I just continued with what I was doing. And, Did you but, ever experience uh, that again? No. Never. Just that one time. Sounds like it was a very desperate fight. It was. It was real desperate. It was in some cases, from what other survivors have said, there was hand-to-hand -hand combat. There was, you know, all kinds of. Supposedly, on the other side of the perimeter, they were sending in their women and children to, you know, steal money and guns and ammo and things like that. How large is the perimeter at this point? Oh. I doubt whether it was 25, 50 yards. Across? Circle. Yeah. It was real small. We had taken it in three times. Now, you've pulled back your wounded. Have you pulled back your dead as well? Yeah. You're not going to leave your dead? No, I'm going to leave her dead. And early in the morning, I'm going to say first light, uh, Bravo Company came into the perimeter. Uh, on their way in, they had taken up some uh it taken some fire firefight and we're thinking what the the d800 wanted to do was put some soldiers out in between both units and shoot both ways and then hopefully we'd open up on each other but it didn't work out did you hear that action yeah between bravo and mm -hmm. the vietnamese they were on the the uh, officers were on the radios to the officers of Bravo Company telling them, you know, 
we're not firing, we're not firing. So, you know, if you get fire, it's the enemy. And then... Were you commanded then to hold your fire? Or? I don't know what they told the troops. I really don't. Uh, they got word to the uh, the guys in charge of the individual platoons, but I wasn't. I was on the other side. I don't know what they said. But uh, they had came in, and Bravo Company, you know, came in through the perimeter, and I could see from the looks on some of the guys' face when they came in that there was a carnage, you know, and the guys were just shaking their heads. Some guys were crying. Bravo or Charlie? Bravo right. Company. When they came in, they could look around and see all the dead that were laying around. And I think there's like 40, 38 to 40 were dead. There was 70-some uh, wounded. Out of? 134. Okay. What was it like that night? Uh, you've told us about the yelling in at you. And no, it was all night long. All night long. There were guys were in pain. Uh, guys wanting water. Guys want something to eat. You know, guys calling for their mothers. Guys just calling for, still calling for medics. You know, help me, help me. And what could you do for them? Not too much. I mean, you didn't know what they were, do you know, where they were. I mean, you could hear a voice, but you know, you didn't know where they were. You didn't knew, know whether it was the enemy outside the perimeter doing it. So yeah, basically, I went around to the ones I could get to and tried to find them water in that. But, uh, no, it was real scary. What were you thinking? My basic thought was helping the ones who I could. That, you know, we're all in this together. We're, you know, we'll go down trying. I wasn't about to try and run or anything, so. What emotions were you feeling? Oh. Again, you were scared. You were. I think I prayed more that night than I ever prayed before. You know. What were you praying? Hmm. What? Just get me out of it. Just get me out. Uh, at that point in time, I didn't care how I got out. I just wanted to get out. Um, you know. Praying for some type of intervention, somebody come in and get us out, whatever, just get out. But again, it was, uh, you know, you kept on hearing these guys crying and screaming and that. And you know, they were in pain. And they were just as scared as I was. And then it was pitch dark, never seen so much dark. I mean, I uh, almost couldn't see your hand in front of your face. With all the trees and everything, it was dark. So I really couldn't go too far. What was Lieutenant Alderson doing all this time? Lieutenant Alderson was, I believe, he was on his on the radios, coordinating movement between the uh, platoon leaders and that. Okay. Um, daylight comes up. What are you thinking? getting out. Somebody's coming in to get us. And then Bravo Company came into the perimeter. What did you think about those guys from Bravo Company? I tell you what, those boys hustled through the jungle all night long. And usually you don't move through the jungle at night. But they had heard that we were getting beat up so bad. They moved all night long through the jungle. And I take my hat off to him. I uh, I was in training with some of them at Polk, and some of us went to Charlie, some of us went to Bravo, something. And I had talked to them later on, and you know they had told me they traveled all night long, not knowing the only thing they heard was that we were in a firefight and needed help. So they th you know pushed through the 
bushes all night long. What a happened? wonderful sight to see. What happened then when they showed up? When they showed up, they helped us go around, try and find some more missing. If anyone was outside the perimeter, uh, they helped us gather weapons because we didn't want to leave any weapons for the enemy to find. Uh, they went out and chopped an LZ for choppers to come in and we took all the wounded out first, uh, then loaded the weapons on the choppers, and then the guys who were not seriously hurt or wounded, then we got on, and then Bravo Company loaded the, the dead on the choppers, and then Bravo Company came out. So everybody, Charlie and Bravo Company, moved out of that position. Right. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go? Went back to uh, Benoit, our home base. What did you do when you got to Benoit? We, I tell you what, it was such, I mean, it, it was just, you had 80,000 things going around in your mind. Uh, first of all, I didn't believe that I made it that I was fortunate enough to come out of it. There were guys that had been there for a year who were seasoned veterans who didn't make it. And here I was three and four days out in the field, and I did. And you're sitting there and you're wondering why. You know, why is that? Uh, what did I do right that they didn't? Or what did they do wrong that I didn't? Uh, you get survivor guilt. You know, it's a, a thing that you can't believe you made it and somebody didn't. And they call it survivor guilt that, you know, bugs you for a while and suffered from that. Uh, couldn't eat for a couple of days, just jittery all the time. And, uh, and the next time we were told to saddle up because we had to get a whole new company again, because there's only 17 of us left. And then we went, just went out on small search and destroys and came back. And uh, how, how long before you went out again? I think it was about a month, I believe. Did you get an opportunity to do any recuperation of any time? Well, you just back in the rear area, the base camp. I mean, they didn't, just sat down. We pulled guard duty for, you know, another outfit. We just manned their perimeter while they went out. And then, like I said, all this time we're getting, you know, more replacements and that. You had to get your company back up to strength? Mm-hmm. Okay. Were you able to get rest? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What did you think about that? I was thinking about Every time you go out, is it like this? You know, every time you go out into the jungle and you're out there for three days, is this what happens? And that's what, you know, bothered me the most until, you know, we went out. And we, I think the next time we went out, you know, we got, didn't have any firefights or nothing. We just went out search and destroy. But, that was the thing that got me. The first time we really went out in the jungle again was, are we going to walk up on somebody again and all this is going to happen again? That's what was scary. After you rested up and you go back out, what was it like then, the second trip out? The second trip out taught me to be more conscious of my surroundings. You know, uh, just like in basic, just like in AIT, watch where you put your feet. Look up into the trees, you know. Watch the guy ahead of you. Make sure there's a guy behind you. Uh, you concentrated a lot more on your surroundings and where everybody was. You're more alert. 
uh, if you smoke, you didn't throw down a cigarette, but you wanted to make sure you field stripped it. When you ate and you had C rations, you made sure that you cut the lids, both top and bottom, off the cans and bent them up and buried them deep. You know, uh, you took everything you could do to stay alive. You know, I think your or your sensitivities were more fine tuned after something like that. Do you think, and that you think was the result of that first battle that you were in? Oh yeah, yeah. It it, it uh, in AIT it almost seemed like a game, you know. Uh, play the game, do what they say, but KMI, yeah, it it brought everything home. You uh, you fine tuned your skills. You were more alert of everything that was going on. What was the longest period of time you ever spent in the field? I think it was a month. Where were you then? Mm, I think we were up around the Iron Triangle somewhere. We ran into a, I think that's where it was, ran into a cache of supplies um, rice and dry goods and almost like a warehouse. Was it a bunker? No, it was, it was some of it, well, they built a bunker out of rice. I mean, that's how much rice they had. And uh, they had all kinds of, it was almost just like a warehouse. It was left open. You know, stuff under tarps and pieces of tin and things like that. So... So what did you guys do? We just waited for the local uh, Vietnamese outfits to come and take over. And that took about a month? Well, all the time that we went out, till the time we found it, till the time they uh, decided who was going to do it, I'm guessing. I mean, when you're out there, days just run together, you know, especially after 40 years. What was that experience like? It was bad because we were, a lot of times we were moving in elephant grass. And that's grass that grows up uh, eight, eight foot or so. So you can't see anything ahead of you. And you, you can't tell if somebody's creeping up on you or not. And that's what was, that, that was frightening. You were always looking out. Because you, you couldn't, you really couldn't tell if somebody was coming at you or not. So, so you guys just set up a camp around this cache of food. Mm -hmm. So you have no showers. No. No latrines. Nope. Did you get change of clothing in? No. How did you get your supplies, or did you just eat the rice? No, we had. We went out. Choppers would come in and drop seas or something and they would chapters would land give us water and seas and ammo but uh, we just had to like I said as far as I only remember getting one change of clothing while I was out in the field uh, other than that it was you know you carried your toothbrush you carried your toothpaste if you're lucky enough, you had soap and you could run down to the local river or whatever or just wait for the monsoons and stand out there and let Mother Nature be your shower. But, uh... What about your clothing? Fatigues. What happened to them? Just got dirty. Like I said, uh, I, only, I only remember getting one change of clothing. I was out in the field. Did you ever get jungle rot? No. No? No. I know of guys who did, but I never did. Okay. Boots stayed dry? and. Yeah, we had the new boots that had the canvas in them, and, you know, they aired out pretty well. They were thin canvas. They had the holes at the bottom for water to drain out. They had the, uh, the canvas sides. You know. They had the... Uh, plastic bottoms. 
of the web the weave bottoms so for supposedly to fend off punji stakes um, did you have any contact with enemy forces while you were guarding this cache of food and supplies yeah what happened uh, we had one uh, had how, many, how many men are there at this point is this company size or? yeah this is company size uh, companies were generally around 220 okay and so we had we had set up a perimeter in that, and the only thing I remember is one one shot, a sniper shot a sergeant, and you couldn't tell where it came from or whatever. Just one shot, one kill. So that was the only yeah. Hostile but there there were other ones and. Uh, there were other skirmishes we had. During that, well, you were no, that No, not cache. there, but during my tour, we had other skirmishes. But none of them were like my first three days in Cam Mai. Did you end up, um, after Cam Mai, how frequently would you be going out? We would go out and we'd be out for a couple weeks, and then we'd come back. What did you stay do? There for, stay back at base camp for... Uh, what was your base camp again? Xeon. Okay. At first it was Bearcat, and then they moved it to Xeon. Never Lyke or Quan Loy? No. Okay. But uh, first it was Bearcat, and then it was uh, Xeon. And we'd come back there, we'd be back there for a week, maybe, and then saddle up and go back out. Okay. And what would be the first thing you do once you got back out? Helicopter got back drops out. you. Helicopter drops you, you form up, get into your uh, platoons, and uh, get all situated, and platoon leaders and that would take everybody and take them out into, the, out into the jungle or out in the field or out into the uh, rubber plantation, whatever you were walking out, usually three columns. And so many meters apart. And just you know, coordination all the time where, where one was, where the other one was. You know, going in such and such a heading. You know, we're going so far. And just walk until it's time to dig in. And you've got the radio all this time. No, after after Cam Mai, I went back to being a foot soldier. I was a regular rifleman. Okay. And I was just in the platoon. I was just a rifleman. Do there you was, remember? There was other times when. Uh, there was one time when the radio men went on R&R &R that they called me to carry the radio when we went out, but it was just infrequent. Um, how long were you in country before you got R&R? &R? Uh, about 10 months. Where'd you go? Uh, Penang, Malaysia. What was that like? It was, I mean, it, they were all Orientals, so it was not too much like leaving Vietnam, but they spoke English, and it was clean, and a hotel, we were in a hotel, you know, hot and cold running water, and beds to sleep in with mattresses, and, you know, it was real nice. Rested for three days, and they had uh, things for the guys and girls that were on R and R to do. There were dances, and you know, some get-togethers and parties, and this was just a time to unwind. But I had waited. I kept on hearing that Australia was going to open up for R and R, so that's why I waited. I was waiting for Australia to open up. I always wanted to go to Australia. 
it's uh, didn't happen. Uh, we're coming back from Penang, and the captain of the plane announced that they had just opened up Australia for R and R. On my way back, uh, I was mad. <laughs> um, you and your comrades are in. Uh, you've described a number of extremely stressful situations. Mm -hmm. When you came back in from the field, how did you relieve stress? Uh, went over to the bar, went over to the club, sat down in, at a table or whatever and just talked about what had happened and whatever. And uh, After that, we sat down and then we started talking about home life. We left the field out the field. We, talked about what we did before we came in. We talked about family and friends and girlfriends and cars and, you know, things like that. And after about the first day, we just left the field in the field and talked about everything else. But spent a lot of time in the bars after coming in from the field. Sometimes they would have movies. They would show movies. And but that was about it, about all the entertainment you had. Anybody use drugs? Not that I know of. I was there in 66, and the time that I was there, I didn't see any. I heard later on that, you know, drugs were uh, were popular. But And I told the guys that were in my platoon that uh, I didn't believe in it. I wanted to go home alive. And if you're going to do drugs, go do them someplace else. But... I personally never seen anybody do drugs. Um, your march to march in country, what happened at Thanksgiving? Do you remember that Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving, we had turkey. They, uh, the cooks, the night before we were in, we were back in the rear area, and uh, they had cooked turkey. So we had turkey and dressing and mashed potatoes and vegetables. And, a uh, regular Thanksgiving celebration. What was Christmas like for you? Christmas, we had Bob Hope. Again, we were back, we were at Benoit, or at uh, Zion, and uh, we had Bob Hope come by and, you know, watched his show, which, you know, it was great. I actually got to see Bob Hope. You want to take a restroom break or anything? No, I just want to get some water. <laughs> I think, to be frank with you, I need it. Oh. Okay, it is Thursday, July 17th, 2008, and we are still uh, speaking with Mr. Dave Peters about his uh, Vietnam experience. This is our second tape. Um, we left off, you were describing uh, Bob Hope at Christmas at Zeon. What were your thoughts like at Christmas time? Oh, thoughts of home. You know, the Christmases we had before and, you know, having Christmas with Mom and Dad. Uh, we got care packages in the mail, and around Christmas time, all the parents and their sons. Christmas decorations. So we would decorate our tents with tinsel and bulbs and the fake snow that you sprayed around and, you know, funny hats and things like that because New Year's was coming up. So, But the thoughts then, you know, you forgot Vietnam. Even though you were there, you, it was all about, you know, Christmas and what it was like to be home and what you did on, well, what different things people did on Christmas and, you know, just family life. Um, what did you think when you got those care packages? Oh, what did that it mean was a to you? Oh, those were blessings. 
and especially when they got from home. Uh, we get all kinds of care for packages. Uh, a lot of times you'd be out in the field and they would deliver them, like churches or civic organizations would bundle them up and they would just send them out to the field and they would have uh, books and cigarettes and chewing tobacco and gum and candy and mints and uh, soap, different things in them. And you always divvied them up, you know, amongst the guys in the company. But when you got back to the rear area and you got them from home, you know, those were something special. I mean, mom's cookies and, you know, stuff from dad and things that your brothers and sisters might have made and cards from your church or school or whatever. You know, those meant everything. It was really a heartwarming thing to get one of those packages. What do you remember about the Bob Hope Show? Oh, uh, not too much because I was way in the back, you know, and the area was just filled with GIs, guys that, you know, got there earlier and got a good seat. I was way in the back. I just remember Bob Hope being up on stage, and I don't know. I think Joey Heatherton was there. And just listening to those corny jokes that he probably told hundreds of times, but they were still funny, you know. And just because I remember watching him on TV at different USOs that he did. And knowing that every year that man gave up his holidays to spend with the troops and just how relaxing it was. Pretty meaningful. Yes, very meaningful. Knowing that, you know, like I said, he gave up his holidays every year for years. You were wounded at Camp Mai, correct? Yes. What was the nature of your wounds? I took a small piece of shrapnel in my leg and in my arm. You weren't evacuated? No. Okay. But you got a Purple Heart. Yes, I did. What other... Uh, Commendations did you receive? I got uh, good conduct medal, the uh, CIB combat infantry badge, uh, meritorious service, the uh, Vietnamese, about two or three Vietnamese medals. Did you receive any decorations for your actions at? Uh, no. Okay, can I? Just Purple Heart and CIV. Okay. Okay. Do you remember your last engagement in combat? I remember the last time I went out in the field, nothing happened. Did you know you were coming up on the end of your tour? Yeah. How long was it before the end of your tour? From coming back? No, okay, yeah, from coming home. Your end of your tour of duty. How much earlier before that was your last time out in the field? Oh, about a month. What were you thinking? Oh, uh, my main concern was, even though I was in a rear area, hope no mortar comes in here. You know, because you always heard stories of guys that had X amount of days to go and a sniper would get them or a mortar would get them or something like that. And you got real paranoid on going to take a shower, you're going to go to latrine, you know, wherever you were going, you got real paranoid sometimes that, you know, somebody was out there that had your number. And then we went from Zeon back to 90th replacement to get all of our paperwork and shots and everything to go back home. And it was the same thing because we knew that Tonsonut, you know, every once in a while we get mortared a lot. So we were, you know, pretty paranoid about that too. You mentioned that. Uh you had patches made to commemorate your experience. Yeah, I. Uh, Can't mind. Do you want to show us the patch? Oh, please? sure. 
I had gotten in touch with a friend of mine. They have a reunion every year at Kokomo, the first full week of, weekend in September. Kokomo, Indiana? Co Kokomo, Indiana. And uh, a friend of mine invited me, said, hey, come on down. So we were t I was talking to him, and he said, you know, we should get something made. So if we meet anybody from Charlie Company, we can, you know, get together and give it to them. And we were thinking about shirts and pins and stuff like that. So I went on my own, and I made this patch. Why? As Charlie Company, 2nd and 16th. Uh, the operation was called Abilene in April 11th, 1966. And so whenever I went to a reunion or I found somebody that was with Charlie Company, I'd give them a patch. What do you think about those guys today? I love them to death. I love them to death. They're the greatest bunch of guys I'd ever met both the ones that survived and the ones that didn't survive because they always take care of you. You, you. I don't believe you have any better friends than the ones you get in the service. Uh, they're, they'll always stand by you. you know, they're always willing to help you out you know, no matter what. And um, I was wishing that I would have kept in closer touch with a lot of them, ones that I remember. Um, I don't believe you, you I think you mentioned you didn't know too much about the 1st Division when you... No, I didn't. What did you, have you studied the 1st Division subsequently, the history? Yes, I have. I, I went online numerous times and found out when they started and how their patch came about and uh, the, a lot of the battles they were with, you know, in World War II and... World War One. Uh, I've been to Fort Riley, Kansas once at uh, their 75th anniversary of the First Division. Uh, they are the oldest division in the country. Um, like I said, I was there when they had their 75th. How does that make you feel to know you're a part of that tradition? Oh, I'm proud as a peacock to be with the First Division. I, you know, I wear my colors high. I wear them proud. I got numerous shirts that have First Division. Uh, my hats, I've got my unit patch, my First Division patch. And, you know, that was just, you know, remarkable that, you know, I did end up with the First Division. The only thing I haven't done is been to the museum, which I'm hoping to go there either this year or next year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when did you leave Vietnam? I left Vietnam the end of March in 1967. I flew home to San Francisco. And you described what your concerns were at the base before you took off, what were you thinking when the plane left? Uh, that they were going to shoot it out of the sky. You know, it, you, until you were over the ocean, you were in fear, you know, uh, something happening. And once we were out over the ocean, that's when the party began. Guys had smuggled liquor on, on the plane, which they weren't supposed to do. And we just partied until we got home. Did get out of control? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got in a little bit of trouble. The, uh, the officers were in first class. And they had to come back a couple times and tell us to behave. And we said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And when they went back into first class, we partied some more. But we had a good time. There was you know, nothing really bad. I mean, no fights or nothing. We got a little bit loud and that, but we did have a good time because we were, you know, happy to be going home. We were going back to the world. And uh, these were guys who, I mean, this isn't all first division. No, this is these guys are guys from, from these are clerks and truck drivers and uh, clerk typists and, you know, mechanics, 
different different unit, 173rd, 101st. Everybody was on that plane, and you didn't know from Adams off Ant, but they were you know servicemen and they were going home. Um, where'd you land? In in California. Then we took a bus from there and went to back to uh, Oakland Army Terminal. How long did it take you to get processed out? Uh, uh, two days, I think, from the time we got there. It was one full day of processing, and then we left the next morning for the airport. Had you completed your term of enlistment at that no. point? No. I still had six months to go, and they give you a... Uh, a dream sheet on where you would like to spend the remaining time. And I put down Fort Ord, California, and I forget which other ones I put in there, but I got Fort Ord, so. So That's you right were happy, there. man. Did you no. get some leave before you reported Fort Ord? Two weeks. Where'd you go? Back home. Went back home to Alliance. How was that? That was great. That was great. Uh, good to see the folks. And me and my brother talked about Vietnam for a while. And Dad talked about being aboard ship in the Navy. And you know, the three of us told war stories. And it was real good. How'd you sleep at night? Not very well. I uh, I had a couple, you know, bad times. And, but uh, was the family aware of that? Yeah, they're the ones that told me. And that, uh, you know. What'd they tell well, you? Well, just that I woke up several times yelling and, you know, screaming and that. I, said, you know, I wasn't aware of it. But, yeah, they're the ones that told me. Would you, okay, then, so that lasted about two weeks and you went back out to Fort Ord. I went to Fort Ord and went to uh, an outfit called CDEC, Combat Development Command. And what we did, we tested ideas and weapons and things for the troops. Uh, infrared rays, ultraviolet rays, sound equipment, things like that to detect movement. And uh, what was that like? Being back out in Vietnam. You're, they ship you out someplace, you spend the night there. And we did most of our testing at night uh, advancing up hills toward the enemy. And, uh, they had uh, their target range, had advancing targets. The targets would start here and these would pop up. And then they'd go down, you'd shoot at them, and then they go down, and then some more would pop up and shoot at them. Suppose these targets could uh, detect a wound or a kill. And we had to uh, full guard duty on the range. So you had somebody every night driving the range, making sure you know, nobody got up there and destroyed anything. But uh, all, your, all this testing was done at night. So then you had the weekends off. A little bit easier than yeah. Vietnam? Mm -hmm. okay. We'd go into town, go into Monterey or... Salinas or somewhere down there. Okay. And then you ended your enlistment. I ended my enlistment at Fort Ord October 18th, 1967. Flipped a coin, either I went back to Ohio or I went to Los Angeles, and Los Angeles won. So I um, uh, moved, moved down to Los Angeles got in touch with some friends of ours that we knew from Ohio and you know and I had a cousin who lived down there so I stayed with my cousin for you know a week or two and then moved to uh, the San Fernando Valley with friends of ours and he got me a job in a cabinet shop where I worked there until I could afford an apartment. And when I could afford an apartment, I moved out. And 
start of my life. About um, a couple months went by, and I remembered a guy that I knew in Vietnam that had lived in the San Fernando Valley. So I started calling around to locate him, and I found him. So we joined up and started hanging around together, and he introduced me to a young lady who he went to school with who eventually became my wife. So we were married in 70, 70, no, 69. We were married in 69. Do you guys have children? I have one, I have one son who lives in Milwaukee. Does he know about your Vietnam experience? Oh yeah, he's very proud of it. He, uh, he oft times would go with me to different things and reunions and that and he was always aware like in the market or someplace I would see another Vietnam veteran either he had a you know wearing something that designated it or his hat said Vietnam or whatever and every time I met one I'd always say welcome home so he picked up the ball and whenever he would see in Milwaukee see somebody that was a Vietnam vet he would always greet him by saying, welcome home. And he was in a bookstore one time, and the guy standing next to him had a hat that said, no Vietnam vet. And Matt said to him, turned to him and said, welcome home. And the guy just looked at him. That, you know, who's this young kid, you know, saying, welcome home. And then Matt said, my dad's a Vietnam vet, and he always told me to respect you. So the guy said, well, thank you. And started to get a little bit teary-eyed. But, you know, Matt, he refers, when he sees a Vietnam vet, he'll tell him, welcome home, too. That brings up a question. What kind of reception did you receive in society when you came home? In society, getting back, coming through the airport, I got the old stuff getting thrown at me and spit on and name-calling and baby killer and you should have died over there. And this happened, was there a protest going when you came through the airport? There was just, it wasn't a real protest, there was just pe kids in the, air, in the airport. I mean, it wasn't an organized one, it was a lot of hippie kids there. And Were you in the air, uh, uniform? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was this in Ohio or in no, it was California? In California. So when I got back to Ohio, nothing, I was still in uniform. and I got off the plane in Akron, Canton, and my folks were there to pick me up and so this is the flight you guys have all been this is the party flight on the way home and you land and then you get this abuse yeah what do you think as mixed feelings you know I, we were told if we ran into it that we could run into protest and if you ran into it, just keep right on walking, ignore it. They didn't want any disturbances. So Could you ignore it? For the most part, yeah. Because I you know, I've been through the worst. These people yelling stuff at me, they were they were gonna, you know. Didn't compare to Cam Mai. Didn't repair to Vietnam period, nothing, you know. These guys were amateurs. The little guy over there with the hat. In a conical hat. He was a professional. But I never let the protesters, you know, really bother me. And you saw somebody spit on a soldier. Yeah. I've seen stuff hurled at you and everything else. You just judged it. You know. How'd that make you feel? It made me feel bad that, you know, society had turned to this. You know, you you see pictures of uh the troops coming home in World War II with the ticker tape parades and, uh, you know, everybody's going wild on the streets and, you know, everybody welcoming them and everything. And, you know, when you come home, this is what you get. Uh, when I landed in Akron, Canton, it wasn't nothing like that. I mean, I was welcomed by my family, so. Do you ever have any other experiences like that when somebody found out you were a Vietnam? Oh, yeah. When I was going to school in Los Angeles. I was standing in line getting my classes, 
and some jock was standing in the line in the other line next to me. And I had my field jacket on with my first division patch and he said something to me about, oh, we got, you know, you a Vietnam vet? And I said, yes, I am. He said, you one of those baby killers? And I says, well, I don't remember that. I said, but I'll tell you what, the Army taught me how to kill very well. And I just looked at him. And he just turned and, turned and walked away. Where was this? This was in Los Angeles, California. What San school? Fernando, San Fernando Valley. Junior college? Yeah. Junior college. L.A. Valley College. Yeah. Anybody else around hear that? Oh, yeah. How did they react? They didn't say nothing. They just, just ignored it. They didn't ooh or ah or nothing. But the guy that I said it to just stepped out of line and walked away. Was so. that prudent of him? <laughs> well, at the time it was. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, the bad thing about it is he was at least a foot taller than I was. You know, he was one of these jocks. I only stand 5'7". So what I said to him must have made an impression because he was the one that walked away. Is there anything that we've failed to talk about today that you'd like to share with us? Just that, like I said, I've been, I hooked up with the first division in Vietnam, not knowing that much about it. But I kept on hearing, you know, things about it when I was in Vietnam. And Who did you learn that stuff from? From the officers and a lot of the enlisted NCOs okay. that I was with. Uh, about the pride and everything. When I got home, I would go to places, like I said, the 75th anniversary, and I went to Fort Riley, Kansas, you know, to see, you know, where, where they stayed. The and home picked, base of the The division. home base, and I seen where Custer was and, you know, all the heritage and everything that was there, all the history is at Fort Riley, the, uh, the graveyards, the, you know, because it's been there for a long time. And I went to their museum and it just tried to learn everything about it the, you know, while I was there. And when I first got my computer, that was one of the things that, you know, I went through and I found out about the First Division, uh, signed up for the society, you know, dues-paying member of the society you know, every year. Um, also with uh, my brigade, my 16th Infantry, you know, I'm a member of you know, that organization because, you know, if nothing else, I am a soldier and as proud as can be to be with the 1st Division, Charlie Company, 2nd and the 16th. Would you recommend that to other vets who are 1st Division vets who aren't members? Yes. I would recommend becoming a member to any vet that I see. And a lot of them, when I, when I meet them, I, a lot of times I'll ask them, you know, you belong to the society, and tell them, you know they should look into it and join. I think the young troopers that are getting out now, the ones that are serving now and getting out now, when they get out, they should sign up for it. And the troopers that are getting out now should get a hold of the people that they signed up with, the ones they served with, get their names and their addresses, and keep in touch with them. What benefit do you think that has for them? Which one? What Sorry. benefit does that have for them? At the time, when you're getting out now, nothing, because you got the rest of your life to go and, and do. But when you get to be 63, you know, you like to sit back and you like to reminisce. And getting back to the guys you served with, you know, 
and we get together a lot of times to talk about Vietnam and that. And we don't discuss the gore and everything. We discuss the good times we had. And I think every soldier should do that. To set aside the war and remember the good times they had in the service. And if they keep in touch with these guys, these memories are going to stay with them. Well, Mr. Peters, uh, on behalf of my family and Ball State University and the Cantini First Division Foundation, thank you and welcome home. Thank you. Thank you for asking me.